23. Psalm 23. We're continuing our thoughts from this precious psalm found in the Word of God. We dealt with it a little bit on Wednesday night, did not finish it, but we will look at it again tonight, or again this morning, and then we'll look at it again tonight. Psalm 23, if we can, out of respect for God's Word, if you're in the auditorium, if you would, if you'd stand, and let's begin reading in verse number 1. Let's read, as we read it, let's look at every word and think about uh, what is being said here. And I want you to understand that, that the psalmist David was a shepherd before he became a king. He had watched sheep. He had protected his sheep. Remember one time he talks about he killed a lion and a bear. Uh, and, and so uh, the psalmist David knew what he was, he was, he was writing this psalm and thinking uh, uh, as a sheep at realizing what he had dealt with when he watched over his sheep. So think about that as we read it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, we thank you for this tremendous psalm that David penned and how it speaks to our hearts and how it spoke to my heart two or three weeks ago as you directed my attention to this psalm, to preach on this psalm during these trying times. And I'm glad that I can say the Lord is my shepherd. And what a privilege it is to know him. And uh, Lord, he's not a shepherd. He's the shepherd, but the shepherd is my shepherd and what a tremendous truth that is we do pray for those this morning that uh, have come down with the coronavirus lord we pray that you put a hedge of protection about them and bring them back to safety I think of this dear preacher brother kenny baldwin who has a coronavirus and who is now out of the hospital and doing well i pray for his his flock his church as now the shepherd is sick the under shepherd has been sick i pray that you'll help them and I thank you, Lord, that this is a big enough church that some of the other staff can step up and take up some of the slack. So I pray for him. Lord, we pray for our health professionals. We pray for those, Lord, that are in harm's way every day who are not in this matter of isolation and separation from others who have to go and deal with people that are sick. We think of our doctors. We think of our hospital staff. We think of our EMTs. We think of our firemen. We think of our uh, police officers. And Lord, we have some of those in our church. And I pray, Lord, that you put a hedge of protection about them. Keep them safe from this virus. And then, Lord, I pray for our missionaries. Some of our missionaries are struggling. I got an email from one family uh, this week who went to the market to get food and couldn't find some of the food that they needed. I pray, Lord, that you provide for them. And I'm glad that the next day they were able to get what they needed. But I, I pray for Jason and Charity Rochelle. Lord, that you help them as they mention this request. I pray for those, Lord, our single missionaries who uh, at this time their husband is gone and so they're facing this, this unknown virus, this, this, uh, this, this trial without a help meet. I pray that you encourage them. We pray for those that are sick. We do pray for Brother Troy Brown. We pray for uh, Brother Art Adams. I pray for Brother Thomas Weidman. I pray for these, Lord, that you help them and, and uh, take care of them, help those that are watching over them. And so, Lord, we pray today that everything that's done will bring honor and glory to thy name. Lord, we're so thankful that many of God's people have chosen, that this church have chosen to come and sit in the parking lot this morning and listen to the service line. And as I was praying this morning, I thought, how many people, will, if we're not careful, will get out of the habit of coming to church? And then it'll be hard to start a habit. It only takes about five, six, seven times to make something a habit. And so, Lord, I pray for them. Pray for our teenagers, Lord, that uh, we used to transport on the vans and not able to transport now. I pray for them that you protect them. We thank you, Lord, for one of our teachers this week sending letters out to students in her class trying to 
stay in touch with them. May some of our workers be able to uh, somehow with a video or something schedule a time to where they can talk to the, some of the kids in their class, whether it be the teenagers or the adults or something. I just, I, Lord, help us to stay in touch with other people during this time. And Lord, if, uh, help us to rally behind those that may have this virus and be much in prayer for them. Do pray for our governor. I pray that you help uh, Mr. Kemp. Thank you, Lord, that he still give us religious liberty right now in the state of Georgia. Lord, we pray for our president that you'll guide and direct him I pray that you give him wisdom beyond his years. Give his staff wisdom beyond their years as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Let's look again uh, as we started on Wednesday night at, at the, that second verse. But let's read the first verse and then go right into the second verse again. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah God, is my personal shepherd. Because he's my personal shepherd... I shall not want. Then he comes down to verse number two, and he says, He maketh me to lie down in green pasture. Now, we dealt with that the other night, and, and when you read this passage and understand sheep, he doesn't say that he allows me to lie down in green pastures. He said, He maketh me. And David is really looking out in his mind as he's been a shepherd all these years. He's looking out in his mind's eye and looking at the sheep maybe that he's tended and realized that due to a sheep's nature, it's impossible to them to lie down unless four conditions are met. Now, I only dealt with those conditions on Wednesday night. But I want to review those. You see, if these four conditions are not met, sheep will not feel free to lie down. If these conditions are met, it's only natural for sheep to lie down. The first one is they must be free from all fear. Uh, they must not be worried about predators. They must not be worried about... Uh, any type of wolf or dog or cat or anything coming upon them and attack because sheep have no defensive uh, mechanism. And then they must be free from friction. If there's a sheep in the herd that's wanting to bully everybody else, then normally sheep don't have a, uh, they just cannot rest. They just cannot relax. And then the third one was flies. And we'll deal with some of them. We'll deal with the friction and the flies a little bit later in our study. But flies, if there were nasal flies that were flying around them or anything like that, it would irritate the sheep, and they just could not lie down. And the last one that the psalmist David is looking at is in verse number 2. Sheep will not lie down as long as they find the need of finding food. So the shepherd takes care of that. He said, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Sheep will not lie down and rest if they're worrying about where their next meal is going to come from. You see, sheep do not have to be forced to lie down. They only need to be in a flock of a good shepherd who cares for them, who's genuinely concerned for them, who has shown them that he loves them, and they're not going to do without. He's going to take care of, care of them. Now, I'm glad this morning to report to you that I have a shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just like that. Man. He's not going to forsake me. He's not going to leave me. He's going to take care of me. And uh, if, if, if it comes time to die, and when it comes time to die, if the Lord tarries his coming, he says, Thou art with me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. But I want us to look at that verse number two, and I want us to give you three points this morning about verse number two. I want you to notice, as I see verse number two, the first part, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures, I see the illustration of a restful life. I don't see sheep that are worried. I don't see sheep that are upset. I don't see sheep that are in a tizzy. I don't see sheep that are wringing their hands and fretting and worried about what they're going to do. You see, I see sheep that are undisturbed by the perplexities of life. And when you look at the sheep described in our text, you cannot help but see sheep that are undisturbed. Uh, uh, the shepherd has taken care of those four things that would disturb them, the four things that would irritate them. He's taken care of them. And can I tell you, as a child of God this morning, there are things that can distress us. There are things that can disturb us. There are things that can discomfort us. There are things that can dishearten and dismay us. And can I tell you, the list of things that cause us to worry is by no means small. We have many things that we can worry about every day. But as the song goes, why worry when you can pray? 
Trust Jesus. He'll be your shepherd. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. It's hard maybe to say you would trust the shepherd in this text if you didn't know the shepherd. You see, the more you get to know the Lord Jesus Christ, the more you get to know the shepherd, the easier it is to be able to trust him. But if you'll understand that this picture of these sheep lying in green pastures is not one that all the things that could have caused them to worry have been eliminated or removed. There are still out there in the woods, there are still predators. There are still flies that could come upon them. However, in this scene, the sheep are not worried about those things. They're not worried about, about the predators. They're not worried about the flies. They're not worried about the friction among sheep. Uh, they're not worried about the food because they have a shepherd that's going to take care of them. You see, they're of no concern to them at this present time because of the shepherd's care. His care overrules and overrides all of those things. Now, worry-free life does not mean we have nothing to worry about. It does not mean... Uh, that all things that cause us to worry have been eliminated or escaped. But a worry-free life means that we're not disturbed by the conditions or the situations around us because we know the one who's in control. And we know the good shepherd. You see, those things that would worry others do not fill our life with anxiety and distress. And I tell you, there are a lot of people last night that probably went to bed wondering if they were going to die by this virus that's going around in our country. Now, I went to bed last night, and I got to thinking, Lord, would it be so bad that if I got a germ and a little old germ virus that it went ahead and took me to heaven? Would, it, would that be so bad if I went on to glory? I mean, through a germ or a little virus? You see, if we know the shepherd, we know we can trust him. Amen? Now, I think we need to use common sense. But a worry-free life is one that in spite of what's going on all around us, we can be restful. Can I be honest with you? God's given me a peace through this thing. Amen? And I believe if you know the shepherd, God can give you a peace. Now, does it mean that we're going to be exempt from it? No. Doesn't mean, but I say it doesn't mean that I'm not going to come down with it. But I'll tell you what it does mean. I know the shepherd, and I know he's in control. I want you to see number one, and when he talks about an illustration of a worry free life, they're undisturbed by the perplexities of life, they're undisturbed by the possibilities of life. If most of us this morning were honest, we admit that most of our worries about things that have never happened. Tomorrow is the key word in most of our words. What's going to happen tomorrow? How about this? How about that? The story is told that a New Testament scholar, Archbishop Trench, became possessed with the fear that the limbs of his body were going to lose all their feeling. He constantly worried about it. One night he was sitting at an elaborate state dinner when all of a sudden he blurted out, Oh, it's finally happened. I haven't got a bit of feeling in my right leg. The lady sitting next to him said, Sir, if it will be of any comfort to you, it's my leg you are pinching. <laughs> you see, a lot of times we worry about things that are not happening. I mean, uh, you know, we worry about things that we may never have to come in contact with. Somebody said, worry is the advance interest we pay on trouble that seldom comes. Most of what we worry about is without cause. But when you picture, and I want you in your mind's eye to picture these sheep lying in green pastures, are there dangers that they may face? Could there be a predator over the next hill? Could there be flies that would bother them? Could there be a sheep in that herd of sheep that would be contemptuous? Yes. But they're saying, I'm not going to worry because the Lord is my shepherd and he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Can I tell you this morning, it is impossible to correctly predict what lies ahead for every one of us. But I can tell you this, it is useless and it is needless for us to worry about what is yet to come. Right. Well, Brother Don Jackson, who's a missionary, told me years ago, that he had something that was bothering him in his mind, I think it was, and he was worried about it and fretted about it. He said he laid down and he got to thinking, he said, Lord, the Bible says the God of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. 
So there's no sense in both of us staying up and worrying about it and, and uh, not sleeping. I'm going to just go to sleep and, and rest in your hands because I know you don't sleep and you got it all in control. That's what these sheep are saying. So there's the illustration of a restful life. Then number two, I want you to see the liberation from a fretful life. When we look at these sheep lying in green pastures, it's obvious to me, and I hope it is to you, that they've been delivered from a life of worry. They are restful, not fretful. Their eyes are on the shepherd, not on the things going around. Not on the things that are encircling them. What does the Bible say? Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on what? Thee. How many people in America, their mind, and you think about it, we are being bombarded all the time on Fox News and the other channels about this virus. Right. May I submit to you, I think most of us would be a whole lot better if we get our Bible, I, I don't think, I know. If we just get our Bible, read the Bible, rest in what God says, don't worry about the other thing, keep our eyes on Him, then I believe we could lay down and have a worry-free life and a restful life. Can I tell you, when I think about the liberation from a fretful life, the presence of worry is condemned in Scriptures. The Bible says take no thought for your life. Take no thought means not to worry. Jesus is condemning the very presence of worry in our lives. And then I want you to see the absence of worry is commanded. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. Now, Paul is not prompting an irresponsible life, but he is commanding a worry-free life. Church, there is the presence of worry that is condemned by Jesus, and there is the absence of worry that is commanded also by the Scriptures. We are not to be like the procrastinating minister, though, who said, I, would, I won't worry, he told himself. The Holy Spirit will give me the message on Sunday. <laughs> and all week long he avoided studying the Scriptures and working and, and praying and talking to God. And he kept saying to himself, the Holy Spirit will give me the message on Sunday. Finally, on Sunday, he stood before his church and he prayed aloud, All right, Lord, give me the message. Much to the surprise of the church, a heavenly voice filled the sanctuary. Why don't you just tell the people you did not study? Can I tell you, we are to use common sense, but then we're to cast everything at the hand of of the Lord. Leave it there. Take it to the altar and leave it there. I think about the disciples one time. They were burdened. And the Bible says they brought it to the Lord. They left it at his feet. There's the illustration of a restful life found in these sheep. There's the liberation from a fretful life commanded in Scripture. But you know the third thing, there's the exhortation for a trustful life. Why are these sheep lying in green pastures? Why? Listen to Psalm 23, 2 again. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. The peaceful conditions of the sheep were the result of the shepherd's doings. They had their confidence in the shepherd. I've read this. Sheep are defensiveness. They cannot protect themselves. When attacked, mules will kick, dogs will growl, bears will claw, goats will gore, bulls will charge, bees will sting, birds will flap, uh, snakes will strike. But sheep are absolutely defenseless. They cannot defend themselves. Ain't it amazing that God likens us to sheep? Can I tell you, we are absolutely defenseless against the devil. We can't be in our own power, in our own strength, in our own might. But God has given us and provided us weapons that we can go with. Not only are sheep defensive, but defenseless. They are directionless. Sheep, I have read, have no sense of direction. Pigeons and other migratory birds have their own built-in radar system. 
You can take an old cat and drop him off in the next county. Few meat, weeks, few months. That cat might show up purring again, but not a sheep. If a sheep gets lost in the back end, it could dwell the can I tell you, if a sheep gets lost, it's lost. Somebody said you, it could get lost in the back end of a pickup truck in the woods. A sheep is, is directionless. To put it very simply, sheep are not all that smart. Is it no wonder that God compares us to sheep? Because of their nature, though, there would never be a worry-free moment if it were not for who? The shepherd. It's the shepherd that makes them light and angry faster. He's the one that's responsible for meeting all these conditions that would have disturbed them. And so all the sheep Brother Kim can do is just trust the shepherd. Can any of you stop? I mean, in spite of all that you can do, in spite of all the hand watching, in spite of all the separation, can you guarantee me, absolute guarantee me, that you will not get this virus? You can't do it. So what you got to do is I'm going to do the best job I can and then I got to trust the Lord for the rest. You see, when it comes to a worry-free life, when it comes to living a worry-free life versus a worry-filled life, the secret is simply this. Put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. On our journey from earth to glory as we face these days ahead, there's two things I want you to do. I want you to trust in the shepherd's presence. It is he that makes them lie down. And if he's going if they're gonna lie down, they're gonna lie down because he does it. And if he does it, it means that who's very close to them? He's very close. Oh. It's the presence of the presence of the shepherd that gives them peace, not the absence of trouble. I remember one time my wife was having a test in Augusta. I remember it now like it was so like it was yesterday. And I got up that morning and I was praying. And I was praying right where McDonald's was there as we turned to go towards Sunset, headed towards the castle. And I said, Lord, I, I know what the doctor thinks and, and I understand all this, but Lord, I can't do a thing about it. I've just got to trust you with it. And I'm putting it in your hands. And just like somebody was sitting right beside me. But in my heart, I heard a small, still voice said something like this. It's going to be okay. She went down there and had the test. And everything turned out okay. Direct opposite of what our doctor, I think, was looking for. Everything turned out fine. You see, it's the presence of the shepherd that gives peace. And rather than journeying through this unknown days ahead with forward in fear, let us look upward in faith. Instead of journeying forward in fear, let us go forward, upward in faith, looking to him. So there's the shepherd's presence. Number two, there's the shepherd's provision. The shepherd will see to it that there are green pastures. Can I tell you this? And I'm reading right now in the presence, I'm reading about five books that deal with the shepherd and, and tending sheep. No shepherd would know, well, put it this way, no true shepherd would ever dream of letting his sheep stop. Now, a hireling that's in it for the money would let his sheep stop. He could care less. Because the Bible says when the enemy comes, what's he going to do? He's going to flee. But the true shepherd's going to stay there. He's going to fight. i got one that fights for me that can overcome any virus. Right. And can I tell you, the virus is underneath his control. Our Lord will take care of us. And understanding that, why should we worry? The scene again before us. The sheep lying down in green pastures. It does not picture a one-time thing or even an occasional abnormal or unexpected experience, but rather it is a day-by-day -day experience. The shepherd is taking care of them day-by-day. What does our shepherd say? We ought to pray, give us this day our what? Daily bread. Just like that sheep would trust the shepherd for the next day. They'd go to sleep at night, not worried about where they're going to eat next morning, because they knew the shepherd was going to take care of them. And can I tell you, since David's shepherd is also my shepherd, 
I too have the privilege of the, of the same day by day experience of the green pastures. You say, preacher, what are these green pastures? I believe they're scriptures of truth, always fresh, always rich, never exhausted. Aren't you glad that God gives us something to feed on every day? He gives us his word. We ought to meditate on it. We ought to chew the cud of God's word. We ought to get our mind stayed on him. What time I'm afraid, I will trust in him. Get your mind stayed on him. We are to be like those sheep that lie down in the midst of green pastures. I think about a little boy as I close that yelled to his mother, Mama! His mother yelled back from the kitchen, What is it, Johnny? The little boy answered, You know that dish that you were, all, you were always worried about? Yes, dear. What about it? You don't have to worry about it anymore. It done broke that ditch. Church, with a shepherd that's always with us, always leading us through life, meeting our every need, we ought to be able to say, I don't have to worry about it anymore. Because of the shepherd that I have, I am the sheep of his pasture. I do not need to worry. If you do not know him this morning by means of Facebook, I would say to you, worry. Can I get an amen? amen. If you don't know the shepherd of Psalm 23, I would tell you right now, you better worry. But if you do, you have no need you're listening by way of Facebook, you say, Preacher, I don't know the shepherd of the 23rd Psalm. I know the psalm. Many people can quote the psalm. Probably even atheists and agnostics could quote the psalm. But they don't know the shepherd. If you don't know the shepherd of the 23rd Psalm, give us a call. Get in touch with us. Let us take the Bible show you from God's holy word how you can know the shepherd. Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the coming again shepherd, has paid the price for your sin on the cross of Calvary. He died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. And he'll save any and all that will come to him in humble repentance and faith. Would you come to him before it's too late? The famous word of the Godhead is come. Would you come to it? Come to Jesus before it's everlasting too late. I trust you'll be tuning in tonight, Facebook, 6 o'clock, as we'll come to you again tonight. In God's name, Lord, we pray that you'll bless the message this morning. Comfort our hearts by the eternal word of God. There's comfort in the scriptures. There's comfort when we know the shepherd. There's comfort in the Holy Spirit. Help us to know the scriptures. Help us to know the shepherd and help us to know the scriptures so that we can receive comfort and can say as David, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Don't get no idea. <laughs> I'm sure you'll make up